Cavitation is the formation of gas or vapor-filled bubbles, or regions within a fluid, due to the presence of low-pressure regions within the flow. When cavitation occurs in an internal flow situation, it usually has a profound effect on the flow's characteristics. Cavitation causes the density, velocity and turbulence profiles of the flow to change. Cavitation can also cause vibrations, noise, and erosion damage when bubbles collapse near a wall, and form a microjet with a high velocity that impinges on the wall's surface. The microjet's impingement on a wall, causes small pits to be dug into its surface. Cavitation can also cause leakage in hydraulic systems due to the erosion of the ceiling surfaces. This can cause a decrease in the efficiency of the hydraulic system. Once cavitation erosion has begun, the resulting rough surface accelerates the damage. Bubbles form when the pressure of the liquid becomes less than or equal to the summation of the liquid's vapor pressure and the pressure of the gas species that are dissolved within the liquid. There are several causes for the formation of bubbles within a flowing liquid in the absence of chemical reactions. The first is vaporization. Vaporization occurs when the liquid changes from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. This can occur due to heat addition, in which case it is called boiling, or due to a pressure drop below the vapor pressure of the fluid at the current temperature, in which case it is called cavitation. The physics that govern both boiling and cavitation are identical. In the case where the liquid contains dissolved gas species, nucleation of gas bubbles can occur when the pressure of the liquid drops below the summation of the vapor pressure and summation of the partial gas pressures of the dissolved gaseous species. An increase in temperature also generally causes a decrease in the gas solubility of dissolved species, and hence increases their gas pressures. This form of bubble nucleation, is what occurs when one opens up a soda bottle. The bottle contains dissolved carbon dioxide at a pressure higher than atmospheric pressure. When the pressure above the liquid is reduced to atmospheric pressure, the gas goes out of the solution and forms bubbles. The vapor pressure of a liquid at a given temperature is the value of the ambient pressure below which the liquid would begin to boil at that temperature. In other words, it is the external pressure that must be exerted on the liquid to keep it from boiling at that temperature. The Antoine equation gives the vapor pressure of a substance as a function of temperature. The vapor pressure in Pascals is equal to the exponential of the shown term, which is a function of the temperature and the factors A1, A2, and A3. The shown table gives the values of these factors for water. For substances other than water, one can obtain the factors of the Antoine equation either from handbooks or by fitting the experimental data of that substance with a curve of the form shown here. When a gas with a given pressure is placed above a liquid, part of it can dissolve into that liquid. At the equilibrium point between the gas concentration within the liquid and the gas pressure above the liquid, the concentration becomes proportional to the gas pressure. The solubility of a gas in a liquid is calculated by means of Henry's law, where the pressure in pascals is equal to Henry's constant, which has units of pascals meters cubed per kilogram, times the gas concentration in the liquid in kilograms per meters cubed. Henry's constant is a strong function of temperature and a weak function of pressure for most substances. Henry's constants for nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, in water versus temperature are obtained by polynomial curve fitting of experimental data. The resulting coefficients for the equation of Henry's constant as a function of temperature are given in the shown table. These coefficients are valid for water temperatures between 280 and 350 Kelvin. One measure of the severity of cavitation within a given flow, is the volume fraction of vapor or gas within a certain region of the flow. The volume fraction is a unitless parameter and it is usually written using the Greek symbol alpha. The volume fraction can have values between 0 and 1. The vapor volume fraction in a certain volume of the flow is equal to the total volume of vapor bubbles within that volume divided by the total volume. Similarly, 
the gas volume fraction in a certain volume of the flow is equal to the total volume of gas bubbles within that volume divided by the total volume the addition of the vapor volume fraction and the gas volume fraction within a certain flow volume gives the total void fraction within that volume finally we can also get the volume fraction of the liquid within a certain volume of the flow as the volume of liquid within that volume divided by the total volume or as 1 minus the total void fraction within that volume the volume fraction can have values between 0 and 1 hence a liquid volume fraction of 1 means that that location has only pure liquid in it with no gas or vapor bubbles on the other hand a vapor volume fraction of 3% means that 0.03 of the volume in that region is occupied by vapor bubbles. When the impeller rotates, one side of its blades pushes against the flow. This side is called the leading side of the impeller's blades. It is shown here in red. The other side of the impeller's blades, shown in blue, is called the trailing side of the impeller's blades. The pressure on the leading side of the impeller's blades is higher than the inlet pressure of the pump. While the pressure on the trailing side of the impeller's blades is lower than the pressure at the inlet. If the local pressure on the trailing side of the impeller's blades falls below the vapor pressure of the liquid, then vapor bubbles form. In the case where a dissolved gas is present, if the pressure falls below the saturation pressure of the gas, then gas-filled bubbles form. When the bubbles subsequently collapse at a high pressure region of the flow next to a solid wall, cavitation damage can occur. An impeller flow channel is the space between two adjacent impeller blades where the liquid flows. If the volume fraction of vapor or gas cavitation bubbles is very high within a given impeller flow channel, this will tend to severely restrict the flow rate out of that flow channel. The resulting unbalanced flow causes a strong unbalance force to act on the impeller. This can lead to shaft, bearing and seal failure. Cavitation can be avoided by several means. First, increasing the pressure at the inlet, by redesigning the flow system involving a cavitating pump, can effectively eliminate cavitation. If the flow system cannot be redesigned, then using a different pump where the pressure is not lowered too much on the trailing side of the impeller's blades can also solve the cavitation problem. A simple solution can be to use a device such as an inducer that tends to decrease the pump's tendency to cavitate by raising the inlet pressure to the pump. The topic of inducers will be discussed in a subsequent section. Another way to solve cavitation problems is to decrease the liquid's tendency to cavitate by lowering the liquid's temperature which tends to decrease the liquid's vapor pressure. If gas cavitation is a problem, then it can be avoided by lowering the liquid's temperature which tends to decrease the gas pressure by lowering the value of Henry's constant. Another method of decreasing the gas pressure in the liquid is to avoid having gas in the liquid in the first place by redesigning the flow system. In order for vapor cavitation to occur, the minimum pressure within the pump must be less than the liquid's vapor pressure. As mentioned before, the minimum pressure within the pump occurs at the inlet side, on the trailing side of the impeller's blades. The reason is that the curvature of the impeller is greatest at the inlet, and the pressure on the trailing side of the impeller is reduced due to the impeller's movement. For a pump operating at a given speed, and pumping a certain liquid at a given temperature, there is a set drop of pressure that will occur from the inlet pressure to the minimum pump pressure. In order to prevent vapor cavitation, the inlet pressure must be larger than the vapor pressure by a large enough margin. This would ensure that when the pressure is reduced further within the pump from the inlet pressure to the minimum pump pressure, it would still remain large enough to prevent a significant amount of cavitation from occurring. The net positive suction head, or NPSH, for the vapor, is a measure of how large the inlet pressure is with respect to the vapor pressure. It is equal to the total inlet head, minus the vapor pressure head. The NPSH has units of meters, or feet, depending on the unit system that is used. The height of the pump that is used in the NPSH calculation is defined as, the height of the highest point in elevation on the impeller's blades. For small pumps, 
the pump's height can be approximated to be equal to H inlet, which is the height of the pump's shaft. Here is a problem for you to solve. A centrifugal pump is used in a pumping application. The fluid being pumped is water. The temperature of the water is at 70 degrees Celsius. The highest point on the impeller blade is half a meter above the height of the pump's inlet. The pump's inlet pressure was measured at 0.6 atmospheres. The pump's flow rate is equal to 0.1 meters cubed per second. The pump's intake pipe has a diameter of 20 centimeters. Calculate the NPSH for this pump. When you are finished, press the play button to check your answer. The solution is, NPSH equals 3.02 meters. Let's see how we got that answer. First we calculate the vapor pressure of water. At 70 degrees Celsius, or 343 degrees Kelvin, using Antoine's equation. We get a value of 31309.98 pascals. Which we then substitute into the next equation. Along with the density. To give a vapor pressure head of 3.19 meters. Next, the inlet velocity is calculated. Using the flow rate. And the cross sectional area of the intake pipe. Which is a function of the diameter of the inlet. The inlet velocity is found to be equal to 3.18 meters per second. The inlet velocity is plugged into the next equation. And the inlet velocity head is calculated and found to be equal to 0.516 meters. Next, the inlet pressure head is calculated. Using the value of the inlet pressure. The inlet pressure head is found to be equal to 6.20 meters. Finally the values are substituted into the NPSH equation. And we find that NPSH is equal to. The inlet pressure head. Minus the vapor pressure head. Plus the inlet velocity head. Plus the difference between the inlet and pump heights. Which equals 3.02 meters. Now you can try varying the above parameters to see how they affect the NPSH. The yellow highlighted text in the equations is the value being changed. And the blue highlighted text are the values affected by the change. When you wish to continue with the lecture. Please press the play button. The incipient, net positive suction head, or NPSHI, is the net positive suction head at which bubbles begin to form in the flow. At values of the NPSH above NPSHI, in the absence of other factors that can cause cavitation. No bubbles form in the pump. This value is not usually used in pump design, since all pumps can tolerate some cavitation. Setting the inlet pressure to such a high value as that required to stay above the NPSHI might not be practical for many pumping situations. The incipient, NPSH is written as NPSHI with a capital small or subscript I at the end. The required or performance net positive suction head is written as NPSHR. It is the value of the NPSH that is required in order for the performance of the pump not to be affected by cavitation. In the 1994 centrifugal pump test standard of the American National Standards Institute, a more precise definition of NPSHR is given. It is defined as the value of the net positive suction head at which the pump loses 3% of its output head as compared to the case where the pump is operating at the incipient net positive suction head or NPSHI, at the same flow rate. In other words it is the NPSH at which the centrifugal pump generates 97% of the head it can generate under the same flow rate if no cavitation is taking place inside the pump. To measure the NPSHR for a given pump. At a given flow rate, the flow rate is kept constant. 
while the NPSH is lowered. Starting from NPSHI. As shown on the figure, initially, when the NPSH is lowered while keeping the flow rate constant, the NPSH versus the pump's total head curve is almost flat. At some point, the pump's total head will start to decrease noticeably as the NPSH is reduced further. The NPSHR is then obtained as the value of the NPSH. When the pump's total head drops by 3% as compared to the total head when the pump is cavitation free, or in other words when the pump is operating at the NPSHI point. There are two methods for adjusting the NPSH for a centrifugal pump. The first method is to adjust the inlet pressure. This can be achieved by changing the liquid's level in the suction tank. The second method is to throttle a suction valve that is located before the inlet to the pump. This would also change the inlet pressure to the pump. This is a simpler way of varying the NPSH. But it introduces disturbances into the flow that is going into the pump that may affect the NPSH reading. The NPSHR, versus flow rate curve, can be obtained by getting the NPSHR value at different flow rates. For example Q1 Q2 Q3 and Q4 The NPSHR, which has units of meters, is then plotted against the flow rate, which can have units of meters cubed per second. Notice that for centrifugal pumps, as the flow rate increases, so does the NPSHR. In other words at higher flow rates, centrifugal pumps tend to cavitate more, and hence require a larger intake pressure. This is expected, since to generate the higher flow rate, the pump impeller needs to rotate at a higher speed. The higher impeller speed generates a lower pressure at the trailing side of the impeller which would then cavitate if the inlet pressure is too low. The available net positive suction head, is the minimum NPSH at which it is recommended to operate the pump at a given flow rate. It must be larger than the NPSHR value and is usually smaller than the NPSHI value. The NPSH margin is the ratio of the available NPSH to the required NPSH. For most centrifugal pump applications, the value of the recommended NPSH margin ranges from 1.1 to 2. In order to achieve cavitation free operation, as stated before, a centrifugal pump needs to be operating at the incipient, NPSH. Yet this is impractical under most pumping situations since it requires an NPSH margin value of between 10 and 20. Hence most centrifugal pumps operate with a small amount of cavitation occurring within them. As long as the cavitation is not excessive, it should not affect the performance of the pump. Nor should it severely reduce the life of the pump's components. Cavitation can cause damage to both the impeller and the pump's casing. The damage rate due to cavitation can be calculated in a variety of ways, including basing the damage rate on the rate of loss of impeller and casing material, or basing the damage rate on the rate of loss of pump performance. The pump performance is often measured based on the total head generated by the pump at a given flow rate. The ratio of the actual damage rate experienced by the pump to the maximum damage rate for mixed flow pump operation can be plotted versus the ratio of the pump's net positive suction head or NPSH to its required NPSHR. As mentioned before, the division of the NPSH by the NPSHR gives the pump's NPSH margin. The numerical values plotted here of the damage rate ratio versus the pump's NPSH margin are just for illustration purposes. Since every centrifugal pump is unique. Next we will talk about each of the six damage zones as listed in the table. For an NPSH that is larger than the NPSHI value at which cavitation bubbles start to form. The damage rate due to cavitation is essentially zero. For most centrifugal pumps, 
This corresponds to an NPSH margin value that is larger than 10. Between an NPSH margin value of 2 and 10, low cavitation occurs, and the damage rate ratio is low. This corresponds to an NPSH that is smaller than the incipient NPSH. The hydroacoustic noise that is caused by the collapse of cavitation bubbles in this case is very faint and can only be detected using sensitive equipment. Now let's zoom in on the region of the curve between 0.8 and 2. Reducing the NPSH margin below a value of about 2, pushes the damage rate out of the low cavitation damage region. For an NPSH margin between 1.2 and 2, the damage rate is medium. This is the region in which most centrifugal pumps operate. This is called the R, or right region of the damage ratio curve. For values of the NPSH margin that are between about 1.02 and 1.2, a large number of bubbles are generated within the flow. This causes the damage rate ratio to be high. The cavitation noise that is generated in this region can often be heard directly by the pump's operator. The noise sounds like pebbles are being bumped around inside the pump. The intensity of the noise and of the damage rate increases as we approach the maximum damage rate value. Pumps that operate in this region for a short period of time suffer failure due to cavitation damage. For an NPSH margin between 0.9 and 1.02, a very large number of bubbles is generated within the pump. The bubbles start to cushion each other's implosions, which results in a decrease in the cavitation damage rate. The cavitation noise that is generated in this case, is reduced as compared to the cavitation noise that is produced in the high cavitation damage region. This region is called the L, or left region of the damage ratio curve. Similarly to the R region of the damage ratio curve, pumps operating in this region experience a medium cavitation damage rate. Sometimes if not enough NPSH is available to operate the pump in the R region, the flow conditions can be adjusted to operate the pump in the L region and obtain roughly the same cavitation damage rate. However the L region is sometimes very narrow and its boundaries are often not known for a given centrifugal pump. Reducing the NPSH margin below a value of about 0.9, causes so many cavitation bubbles to be produced. That the vapor volume fraction falls below 0.5. This means that more vapor is present within the pump's inlet than liquid. At some point, the amount of vapor will be so large that pockets of pure vapor will form in some of the impeller's passages. When this happens, the impeller passage is said to be vapor locked. Those vapor pockets can extend all the way to the impeller eye, in which case all the impeller passages become vapor locked. When that happens, the pump stops pumping liquid, the flow rate coming out of the pump becomes zero and the pump is essentially running dry. Since there is no liquid flowing out of the pump, the velocity of the fluid entering the pump slows down, and hence the pressure at the inlet increases. This can cause the amount of cavitation to decrease just enough for flow to be re-established within all or some of the impeller's passages. However, shortly thereafter, the pressure within the pump's eye is lowered again due to the increased flow rate. This would again cause the pump to become vapor-locked. This cyclic phenomenon would cause chunks of liquid to be flowing out of the pump, followed by periods of no flow. This very unstable and intermittent flow causes severe shock loading on the pump's components. The sound produced by this flow regime is a metallic banging sound that is accompanied by violent vibrations. This flow regime is the most damaging for the pump and can destroy the pump in a very short period of operation. <laughs>